Good morning and welcome to the Teams ABA. I, uh, we come to you today, uh, I've got a great presentation for you and um, I want to introduce some uh, of our panel members. Our panel members come to us from the Katib Lifeline team. Our Lifeline here is to help, our goal is to help you remove the obstacles from what you're doing so that you can accomplish your work. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce Daniel. This is Paul. Hey, um, good morning. My name is Daniel Huang. Um, I'm interested in the new year at Katib. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nigel Mayak here. I'm also an applications engineer here on the, the Katib Lifeline team. I look forward to working with you all in the future. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Paredes. I'm a mechanical engineer with some past experience in R&D. Very good. Thank you. And without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Grayson Donovan, and he'll be giving our presentation on Sailor to Wanlin. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, so we're going to hop into this real quick, and uh, I want to give a little bit of background as to how we came to this topic. Uh, initially, the webcast began with a high focus on skid design using frame generator, but even a complicated skid depends on a robust and a sound skeleton. And my goal for this webcast is pretty much to get you to understand how skeletons can be used for more than just a frame generator, and with a little bit of setup, they can truly make a dynamic design. So we're going to talk about a few different types of geometry that a designer can exploit, and that is mainly dealing with 2D and 3D sketches, and also utilizing 3D solids. So before we jump into the actual presentation, I want to define exactly what I'm talking about here. And skeletons are primarily only thought of when we're talking about frame generator. But I like the skeletons as more of a jig for my structure. And just like a jig would control the location and motion of another tool, I'm going to be utilizing skeletons in a way that I can control the motion and location of various parts and features within my design. So our first example is going to be a simple 2D sketch. Now, 2D sketches are an excellent way of controlling a structure within a single axis. Um, you can easily control things such as the height and also the length of my truss here by going up to my part features and then changing to select my sketch features. Now inside this, I can go ahead and double click on my skeleton and I'm going to change a few of these dimensions to affect my skeleton. So what we did is we changed our height to 75 inches and we also made it 30 feet long. Now I would like to also express that you don't want to get too complicated with 2D sketches just because it complicates the way that the constraints will talk to one another. And what you'll end up finding is that as you move the structure around, you're going to start getting a lot of errors. Now you'll notice that since we use the frame generator tool, the members automatically populated to what they needed to be, and now we have an updated design. Our next example is going to be utilizing a 3D solid. Now 3D solids are an excellent way to create pretty much a 3D structure utilizing a simple model to create our profile boundaries. Now what we can end up doing with this is launch like a sketch where we can place our frame on the sketch with the profile boundary of my 3D solid to drop in some of these angle lines. We can further you know, move these around, change our angles, and then once we have everything that we want, we'll press OK and we'll jump through to populate. Let's go real quick. Now, another thing, too, is that this still all remains parametric. So if I want to go ahead and hop into my skeleton real fast, I can affect things such as my length and width, but then also I can adjust my height. Now, another thing that this does is it really kind of cleans up my structure so that I don't have a lot of features at my top level assembly. Now another thing I want to touch base on too is that a lot of times you're going to run into issues if you use a skeleton that's a 3D solid and trying to get your weight. Um, primarily what will happen is the program will still read this skeleton as a solid assembly. So there's a couple different ways you can go about getting around this. One of which is to suppress it. Now suppressing is really great. It's quick and easy. You just come over here. I'm going to just right click on my skeleton and be done with it. Now something that can happen every once in a while with this is you can lose your associativity to your members. So what I started doing was rather than suppressing the feature, 
is actually coming in and changing my mass to zero. Now, effectively, that's the same exact thing as pressing it. It doesn't, the mass won't affect my center of gravity at all, so I can get those calculations. And the way that you would do that is you just go ahead and right click. I'm going to go into my properties. Pull that down. And I'm going to hop over to my physical tab. And then let's go ahead and update this. You'll notice that I already did this, so we have a zero mass. And then my center of gravity restrictions are also going to be disabled. Now, this is great for production because now you do not have to worry about your center of gravity getting messed up. So for my next example, we're going to hop into a little bit of a combination. So we're going to be dealing with, in this one, it's going to be a 2D and a 3D sketch in concert. Now, an advantage of this is that I'm able to control multiple unique members within a single assembly, and then each one is dynamic in its own right. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to select my sketch features again. And let's change some of these dimensions for the support. So let's pull this one out to about 100 inches. We'll put this one to about 50. And then let's adjust some of the other dimensions here. So now we're going to update this. And notice that my support's going to pop over to the new location that I put, and then it's automatically going to resize itself. So what this allows the designer to do is to work from a top-level assembly and then be able to like, you know, fine-tune and manipulate the design so that it fits what they're trying to accomplish. Let's go ahead and save this. Now, when we get, start getting into actual skid bases is when we really can kind of expand on the power of what a skeleton can actually do for your design. Now, what I have is a little bit of a complicated assembly here. We have you know, a simple mounting pad for a vessel. We have four lifting lugs in place. And then you'll notice that my skeleton here actually has a few different dimensions. And what I have these tied to are different parameters. So let me hop into this skeleton real quick, and we'll take a look at this. OK. So right here, I have my skeleton. Simple 3D extrusion, where it's being controlled my length, width, and height. And then I also have a few parameters in here, you know, my lifting lug spacing, my center of gravity, and then also have my vessel x, y coordinates. Now, I have everything driven off of my parameter list. And by coming in here and modifying these values, I'm able to drive my design. So let's change this down to about 20 feet. Maybe we'll go to about 10 foot width. And then we're going to leave our height alone because our height's in reference to our structural members. Now, another thing you'll notice as well is I have my center of gravity. So I'm going to change this to, what do we go down to 20 feet? So let's keep this right in the center. You'll notice that my skid automatically adjusted for that. We're going to put my lifting lug spacing at probably about 80 inches. And then that'll populate. And then I can also, within here, I can control a vessel's x and y coordinates and then additionally my BCD. So let's change that to a six foot bowl circle diameter. And let's pull this back so it's more on the drawing. Now, another way that you can also use this parameter list and then having the skeleton set up in this way is you can use it as a checkpoint. Now, in production, there's a lot of time spent checking the drawings and making sure that the values that you have are going to correspond to different equipment, per se, this vessel. Using this sheet, I can easily have my designers export or just take a screenshot, and I can confirm that my vessel BCD is going to match whatever I have on the drawing. It'll eliminate some of those production issues that you're going to get further down the line. Let's go ahead and finish this. We're going to save it, and now we're going to hop back over to my actual skid base assembly. So you'll see right now, it's still going to show my home profile changed. We haven't updated our members yet, but we're going to come up here to the top left and then update. And then the program's going to take into account the changes that I made, and it's going to adjust all my frame members over to where they need to be. Now, another thing that I have hidden is a skid decking. And once it's finished populating, I'm going to show you real quick how you can also make your skeleton talk to other components. Now, right now, we're just using it to kind of control where things are going to locate. But what I'm going to do is have my skeleton drive my length and width of a deck plate and then also populate the description for me. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that on real quick. And then now we'll have a deck plate on here. And if we come over and we take a look at those properties,
you'll notice that my description is driven by a parameter. And I'm going to go ahead and expand that. And we're going to see that skid decking is being derived by dimension 0 and dimension 1. So what I want to do is hop into that skid decking real quick and see how we did that. Now, if I hop into my parameters real quick, you're going to notice that we have my length and width at the very bottom underneath my parameters, but that it's driven off of my skid skeleton. So in order to accomplish this, all I did was I simply linked and then selected my skid skeleton out of my selection. Another thing too is by using these exports and then coming into my properties and then taking a look at my description again. I can use any dimension that comes out of that skeleton. So if I wanted to have some pedestal plates, I could have parameters and plates within my skeleton that would drive my pedestal and then have those conveyed over to my plates. Um, another thing that you could also use this for would be to control maybe the location of some gussets. Um, you can drive the height automatically so that they'll always match what they're supposed to be within your pedestal. Another thing too we can take a look at is that you don't even need to hop into the skeleton and make those changes. Just like the rest of the sketches that we're dealing with, I can just double click on this vessel X dimension and if I so wanted to I can just make sure that maybe this is a change that I want to make and just primarily just change it to maybe 100 inches. And then that'll populate and move that for me. So I'm not just restricted in only dealing with the skeleton, but it maintains all the same uh, associativity that I would have in a simple structure. So just a little bit of a recap of what we kind of saw there is we took a quick look at you know, 2D and 3D sketches and how those cooperate with one another. We took a look at a 3D solid and how we can use that as a really simple model. And then when we jump into skid bases and we talk a little bit about how the skeletons interact with the components that are inside them, we really see that skeletons are useful for more than just dropping some frame generators on it. You really can kind of isolate and minimize the amount of human error that you can have within a structure and then thereby increasing the production schedule that you have. So we're going to hop into our Q&A section real quick. If you have any Q's or questions, go ahead and type them in. So we have a couple questions that have come in. Uh, we just start, uh, the first one is uh, from Bob. Uh, how would how would skeletal modeling compare to using this uh, spreadsheet for design? So I'm going to ask uh, Jose to take that question. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Uh, well, the truth is they're actually quite similar, but if you were to use a spreadsheet, it would actually be easier to do a copy design. Uh, and also, there the difference between the spreadsheet is you would have to interface between two different uh, programs, an outside program. To expand a little bit on that. What you're going to find is that most of the, the commands that you want to access are already within the software. And when you have an outside spreadsheet, it's really easy to control parameters, but not necessarily the associativity between the different components. So what you'll end up finding is that when you start to really dive into parameters and how they connect with you know, your user properties and uh, user dimensions, and then also model dimensions that are automatically loaded for you, uh, Using it within the program and having that access, in my opinion, is a lot better than just having an outside sp uh, spreadsheet. Now, driving on that, if you did want to set up a spreadsheet so that you could do a lot of model checking, that's an excellent use for it. You already have a spreadsheet. The designer can just go ahead and send that to you. You can compare that versus whatever notes that you have and move in that direction. So it's going to depend on really the application and what you're trying to do with the software. Very good, thank you. So another one comes in from uh, Jim. Uh, what kind of editing can be done to the members of the frame generator? Go ahead and ask uh, Daniel this one. Editing is very simple. Um, you can pretty much do any editing you want through the skin, um, skeletal design and modeling. Um, so it's very basic, and you can pretty much do anything you want. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's question. Um, But yeah, pretty much. Oh, okay. 
Very good. Um, so can you add custom members to uh, the frame generator? Oh yeah, um, that's that's very easy. And the quick quick answer is yes, yes you can. Um, we actually have great ABAs on that. Uh, if you check out our past uh, ABAs, we have a lot of content on um, customizing your content center. And if you need help looking for those, or if you have enough interest, um, feel free to fill out those surveys at the end of this webinar to let us know that that's something you're interested in, and we can get that um, maybe in the future as well. And uh, Nigel, uh, what kind of editing? Can be done. Uh, can, are there other things that can be added to frame generator members, and how do they behave? So yeah, to um, go off of what Daniel said about editing, uh, you can go ahead and edit any part, um, any member in the frame generator, and it won't necessarily apply those edits to the other members. So they work as individuals of one another um, in that sense. So for example, if you wanted to use wood and add maybe some bevel cuts to the top of a member, you can go ahead and do that, and it won't apply said edits to the other members in your assembly. Do a few more. Okay, so can you create a cut, a cut list from this? This comes from Jorge. Yeah, so you can create a cut list. That's going to go into setting up inside of your first of all your bill of material format, and then also the properties that are going to be exported to each of those members. So there's a few different ways you could do this. Namely, either maybe you want to create a custom property. Uh, maybe you want to designate something inside your actual part within the, the main summary to drive that. But your cut list, it can be completely developed. Very good. Um, I have a lot of problems with skeletons. This comes from Joe saying, um, I have a lot of problems with skeletons when working with Vault. Uh, any pointers? Um, I'll take that one. Um, when uh, when you're working with a skeleton, we want to make sure that that skeleton is checked out. So that is a, an individual part. You want to make sure that's checked out. Also, the assembly, the top level assembly, will need to be checked out. Is there anything else, Grayson, that you can think of that um, might affect a? Uh, I would say that naming convention is really important, especially when dealing with copy design. Um, you want to name your components in a way that they're going to be easy to change out. So when you start dealing with you know a simple structure, and I only have three or four members. You don't really have to worry about it too much. It's really easy to go and read. But if you get one where you have hundreds of members, being able to have maybe some kind of prefix that's easy for you to just swap out is a way that you want to go. It'll really help speed things up, and then you're not going to run into issues where my skid is now using a member that belongs to something else. And you're going to have a lot of issues when you make changes that way. Very good. I think uh, that concludes our questions. Okay. Um, I think I will give you guys a few minutes if you want to add anything in there. Uh, any other party comments? Um, yeah, so I did realize that I kind of skipped over frame generator a little bit fast in this. Uh, it wasn't kind of the point of the webinar. I wanted to really emphasize just what skeletons can do. And going further on that, I would like to definitely get a webcast in here. If you have more interest in actually using frame generator and how tips and tricks on how that tool actually works, feel free to fill out the survey, let us know, and then we'll definitely get one of those topics up for you. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.